Hello guys, it's me, Libluini, with a new turn of... Hey, it's Afro School and... Ah yes, a funny message from our player of Bogarus. Mm. So anyway, I'm Libluini and this is me in another turn for our multiplayer game. More money, more trouble. Uh, problems too. Wow. I'm doing this how often now and I'm still fucking it up. Wow. And we get a message off from Garth. Yes, now that we are in the end game, everything heats up, including the frequency of funny messages. And we used Tartarian Gate and Legend of Wilds to summon some crafty undeads for us, and we lost a mage thanks to the global casting dawn tons and tons of. Uh, lightning strikes, yes that was the water I was searching for. Then we got some unexpected events but nothing dramatical and a castle is completed. Never my mage dies to disease, probably because he got too old or something. And now I have to reorganize our military for the inevitable strike on Bogarus. To recap the strategic situation, Garth is summoning tons of blood vampires horrors from outer space and other creepy ship, but Bogarus does the same, can do the same and is larger. And Bogarus is in a better position for us to invade, so Garth can stay our ally. Pangea is strange, the player is visibly burning out, but he is also fucking huge and everywhere, including in the oceans to our south. So he is just barely a lower threat level than Bogarus, basically because for Pangea it's a bit harder to amass giant mountains of vampires. But Pangea is on our destruction list if the war with Bulgarus is concluded at some future point. But strategically, right now, I'm allied to Garth and to Pangea and all three of us are trying to kill, death, destroy Bulgarus and eat his lands. So we may become stronger and have a better chance at winning the game. Of course, as soon as Bogorus is reduced to something small and harmless, our aliens will immediately break. Luckily, Garth knows that I'm already thinking of targeting Pangea, so we have a secret second pact. We want to destroy Pangea the moment it turns against us, and of course this means the, the moment Bogoros is dead, it will be probably us two against Pangea, and as soon as Pangea is dead, well, I hope I'm fast enough to steal some drones for the necessary win points, or Garth will win. In a straight up fight, it's basically really hard to win against him, except for if my undead machinery comes into work, but that's a plan for later. Now we are amassing fucking huge armies. Uh, it's kind of funny, but with our flying units we could do so many surprise deep strikes that's not even funny anymore. But since I have tons and tons of mages to juggle, we can't just throw everything everywhere. And of course I have still some mammoths, and while mammoths can walk really fast, and some easy terrains. With all this forest and swamps around, it's kind of hard to move them more than a single province a turn. Anyway, I've started to collect some raven lords and give them more gear to be even more stealthy, so I can't be as easily found. And then I'm sending them deep into Bogoros territory in preparation for my later strike because I'd like to see where most of his stuff is before I'm waltzing in. And uh, Raven Lords at least can fly, so they're better scouts than our actual scouts, and 
mostly because they also come with the ability to command some soldiers. And late age Kalom has some stealthy flying soldiers I can recruit. So in case our spies get noticed, they at least have a chance of winning. And if I amass enough of them and their little squads in an enemy province, I have a sh small chance at actually attacking and getting it. Of course this tactic would probably work better if this were a uh, gimmick game where everyone has tons and tons of money and resources because this inevitably translates into high province defense which kind of destroys this stealthy tactic. But at least at the end of the day I still have tons of very hard to find spies in Bogoros territory and that's at least a small consolation prize. If this were a normal game of course I could use all the, these stealthy guys to, to, to wreak havoc left and right. On the other hand, if this weren't a gimme game I probably would instead try to get more mages instead of trying to recruit uh, raven lords. Their use is rather situational in a normal game. So anyway, you see Pangea is down in those water and we got our own water region last turn. And now I'm sitting basically on you, the, those useless pale ones forever. Well, shit. Well, at least they did something right before I stopped recruiting them forever. Here I'm recruiting... Ah. Yeah, I'm selecting everyone first and then deselecting the few mages I don't want to have in the same army. In this case, I mean it's nice that I can at least see the magic paths of my Harab Seraphs. That makes it a bit easier. But it also means since the paths aren't shown in the army screen, it's kind of it gets kind of complicated as soon as I have more than one type of Harab Seraph in an army. Because of course obviously a scripting for my level two death mages won't work on all the other guys. So instead I have to do a lot of renaming so I keep up with who is supposed to do what. Man, I really need to play a nation where it's easier to remember what kind of paths my main mage has. Or I just have to put my foot down and try to have only one type of Herob Seraph in one army so there is not a, no confusion possible. Of course this would lead to me not having that many mages in the first place since to recap again the Herob Seraphs get most of their magic paths due to random chance and to be really useful in an army a mage should have for the main strategy strategy you want to use at least level 2. Optimal would be level 2 and a, a spell to power them even more up like R2 for example can become R3 if you have one mage casting storm then the other ones can use a spell to make themselves more powerful. That's the ba basis of every Thunderstrike death battery. The same thing is with fire. Fire has a good spell to make a level 2 mage a level 3 mage. Water mages have a similar spell but, he d but it doesn't work on land so in 90% of the cases of the use cases you won't ever be able to use it. And the best spell to destroy enemy armies with water magic doesn't work underwater so there is no reason to power. In many cases no reason to power up your level 2 water mages underwater. It's kind of strange. Water magic is kind of weird considering it's not really that much more useful underwater. 
Underwater is basically the red-headed stepchild of Dominions 4. Then next, Earth. Earth has some interesting spells, but most of them need more than level 2 or 3. Nature is even more weird. Blood is something else entirely. And death is astonishingly useful, since there is one important spell who only needs level 2 in death, and that's Hearts of Skeletons. And as long as you just have enough level 2 death mages, you can basically destroy entire armies on your own simply by drowning them in a giant horde of skeletons. It also helps that, because of the <laughs> battle, even really bad level 2 death mages will wake up, cast another horde, and then sleep for a couple turns, so as long as an enemy isn't using, using the same tactic on the battlefield just with better mages, you're soon to win. Anyway, in this case I of course was concentrating on death, and funnily enough the one mage who can possibly use storm or who I crafted, yeah, can you storm? Is the Hera, is the elder, elder seraphs from my capital, and they are slow to recruit, so I only get one every two turns instead of the dozens and dozens of normal Hera seraphs I can get from all of my empire. So basically, I have a shit ton of those little Hera seraphs, but as you can see, some have water, some have <laughs> death, some have, some have earth, some have fire, and only rarely you get a double level in something. I think the baseline is one level in air and one level in death, and then you get the chance of another path. That's it. That's it. And then you have a chance to get water, which is useless for my, my strategy, especially since no, I don't have a reason to make underwater majors anymore. Then you can get fire, which is situationally useful, but not by that much. Then of course you get majors who are ever either level 2 air uh, or level 2 death. And here the problems start in strategy. You could use an air strategy with late age Kalum like with other Kalumite nations from all the ages, but you have just one third of your recruited mages with the right paths. And even worse, the leader mages you can get from your capital will randomly be stronger in death magic than in air, so it's casually, basically not really that much useful for air armies. You can do it, but it's hard. On the other hand, there are a lot of other spells and rituals to make deaths a slightly bit stronger as a strategy, which is why I ran this way. So basically, about one third of my Herob serves have the right paths to spam skeletons. But on the other hand, there are a lot of death mages I can summon, either with my pretender, or with some of my special capital mages, and as soon as I have those, which I have now, some Mount Fiends for example, I have enough levels in death magic to continue to summon those other mages. That's the strategy you can't use with air because with the exception of the air queens there aren't that many summons with strong air paths, at least none available to late age Kalum. The funny thing is, there are some, I think, who are good in Astral, or maybe also in Air, but they are hard to get, because they need Astral Paths to summon. And, surprise, surprise, you don't have any Astral naturally here, so if you don't plan ahead for it, <laughs> with your Pretender build from the beginning, then you will never see those other summons. And since my strategy was death focused, I have the right paths to summon those e the evil versions of those 
special summons. You already saw one of the one of them, a greater Deva. And well, everything taken together, Dev seemed the best power strategy to go. Especially since almost every other nation in late age will go to blood, as it happens here with Bogaros and Garth. And blood do does so many nasty stuff to living fear things that's really really better to go under it besides. As you can see with vampires for example, death and undeath kind of mixes a little bit at the end. We don't have the right paths to summon vampires. But there is a certain trigger you will see in the future where I theoretically can get my own vampires by proxy. But that's something that's still a lot of turns off in the future. Around this time, I was still doing my best to juggle all those shitty giant armies. Here I'm creating and a little death army here with my Dev of Evil Intentions. Of course, he gets also some death gems to use in battle. For the beginning, he will simply try to stiffen the bones of every living thing, and he will cast Eternal Darkness so that living beings will be fucked. Then he will cast Soul Vortex to protect himself against attacks. And then, basically, standard deathmage tactic of spamming skeletons and stuff. Of course, I have to be careful with this particular army, because if this guy goes into battle, well, most of the stuff he, I've already told you in earlier turns, most of the stuff he can use and will use is absolutely deadly to every other unit I have, including my Death Mage Herobs are off since they are all still living beings themselves. Of course, I'm recruiting enough Herobs serfs each turn so I <laughs> to slowly replace any battlefield losses, but it would really have helped if I had successfully slipped in a global of my own, like the Realm of Misery, because really I need more Death Gems. I'm slowly alchemizing my other gems away, but it's still. I'm still using up too many death gems. That's the one drawback as Late Age Kalom. Because Late Age Kalom is such a mixed nation with so many possible paths to go, it also gets a rather mixed starting death gem. A uh, gem income source with air, earth, and death. Of course, not much from everything. So what I had to do was going around side searching a lot, but because obviously, with the exception of my pretender, most of those guys have level two death at most. I missed a lot until I started to use my pretender and spells to take a second look to get more. But I also weren't that lucky, so my Dev income is rather mixed. I'm very dissatisfied with it, but well, that's how the cookie crumbled for us. <laughs> anyway, that army is now ready. I'm now thinking about, about relocating it. Oh, everyone who ha sh should have gear has gear. And the majors are all appropriated. Monsters and chef units are there. Well, what I'm doing now is taking a look to see what kind of mages I've had overall in numbers, support mages, death mages, and so on. Now I'm slowly selecting the leaders and mages for one army, because spoilers, I've build forces up in a way to create two separate armies and now I have to very carefully tear those forces apart 
but don't worry, even if they accidentally march together, they are, as you have glimpsed from my army setup screen, they are kind of built to be one giant force together, but they are also structured in a way that if I have ha only half of them, they are still a functionally working army on their own. This way I have one giant death ball <laughs> for the invasion, but if I have to act faster, I can also tear them apart into two separate armies, which I think I even have to do on the march. Here yeah, I'm still thinking about this. You also see all those arrow other forces moving around. At this point I'm still a couple turns away from my planned northern offensive. At least my feints down in the south will work as I intend them to work, mostly because by stupid dumb luck they are the first ones to move and then I am probably move the army in the middle and then only then I am probably ready to move the northern ones. So Bogarus should have other things to worry about before my main strike lands. Of course as you know the northern forces are a bit experimental with their bane fire spells spellcasters and their uh, giant flying monsters I wanted to try out so there is a chance that my feint in the south will turn into a, to the actual strike at the end. Only the future will tell and I really wish my cat would. Ah yes, oh go to sleep. Ah well my cat was sleeping on my leg the entire time. Ah, oh, now it's a bit stiff. Ah, oh, sweetie, hmm? Sleep. Go to sleep. So anyway, where was I? Ah yes, movement. So as you see, one army will now march directly to the northern front. One will take a little detour through the south. And if necessary, you can use them to attack one target or to draw them at two enemy fortresses at the same time. I think something like that was my original plan. Now let's see if I, seven months later, can still remember what I did and what I planned to do. Since I have used up many many death games now during the last couple turns, my lonely summoner has to stay around and wait for a while. Also I see I'm sending some reinforcements under the water. I've totally forgotten why I did this. Either to move something stealthily or to reinforce that lonely underwater fortress to make it hold out. Yeah, it's still kind of ugly. Three of Garth's globals and two of Bogorov's globals. Ah, anyway, this turn is over. Libluini locks out. I'll see you next time, people.